Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to our series Science in the Quran. The title of this series of episodes is The Story of Sunshine and Iron, a weird title I know. When we finished our series on relativity and the Quran, we capped it off with the world's most famous equation. We went through a brief derivation of E equals mc squared and talked about what a watershed moment that was in human history. When we discovered that matter and energy were not separate things as had been thought for thousands of years among scientists, but that they are in fact the same entity, that they are interchangeable, that energy can turn into matter and matter can turn into energy according to Einstein's equation. We would like to use this as a springboard to explore one of humanity's greatest puzzles. And to start us off, let's look at verse 13 from Surah An-Naba. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وجعلنا سراجا وحاجا And we have placed therein the sun, a lamp full of blazing splendor. And indeed, one of humanity's greatest puzzles was trying to understand sunshine. The sun comes up, alhamdulillah, every day. We take it entirely for granted. But I would like us to walk together through humanity's incredible journey to understand this amazing creation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَحَاجًا We have placed therein a lamp full of blazing splendor, a blazing source of light. And we can begin thinking about it by underscoring that sunshine not only needs to be present for life, but it actually needs to be relatively constant in intensity day after day, year after year. Where does it come from? Humans have wondered that probably from the dawn of time. Of course, we have fire here on Earth. It also gives off light and heat. But we've all seen fire. It is shapeless, it changes in shape, and it runs on fuel, and as soon as that fuel runs out, whether it's wood or coal or oil or a candle, the fire is extinguished. The sun looks like a ball of light that simply keeps shining. How does that happen? Now, why would we walk down this road? Again, Remember the theme of our course, the main theme of our course, which is that the more we understand about science, the more deeply we can appreciate verses of the Quran. And I hope, inshallah, at the end of our journey, you will look at this verse, وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَحَاجًا and feel its majesty in a deeper and richer way than perhaps you did before. That is the hope and the aim of this course. As we go down this journey, some of you will say, well, where is the Quran? I have a simple answer to that. Don't say that. As Muslims concerned about using science to better understand the universe, to better understand its majesty, it doesn't always have to relate to a specific verse of the Qur'an. The more we know, the more humble we are before the creative power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But inshallah, we will relate this story to verses of the Qur'an. I would like to acknowledge that a lot of the information I'll be presenting here comes from this monograph by Isaac Asimov, who is perhaps more famous for his science fiction than his science, but a wonderful science fiction writer and a wonderful scientist in his own right. So from the dawn of time, humans have realized that sunshine is essential for life on Earth. 
and about 1370 BC, the Egyptian king Akhnaton, Akhnaton began a religion of solar monotheism, where he proclaimed the sun to be the only god. This didn't work very well for him. He defaced monuments that were to other gods before him and so forth, and as soon as he was dead, the, the priesthood rebelled against him. But in any case, he proclaimed the sun as God. So that was one of the first attempts to explain sunshine. That you don't need to explain it, it is the creator. And so it is the first cause. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam for a brief moment considered this idea. And so let's pause here to consider verse 78 from Surah Al-An'am when Ibrahim alayhi salam was searching for the cause of heavens and earth, searching for what was the prime cause behind this wonderful creation that he saw. And the Quran tells us, فَلَمَّا رَأَى الشَّمْسَ بَازِغَةً قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي هَذَا أَكْبَرُ فَلَمَّا أَفَلَتْ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّمَّا تُشْرِكُونَ When he saw the sun rising in splendor, he said, This is my Lord. This is the greatest of all. But when the sun set, he said, O oh my people, I am indeed free from your guilt of giving partners to Allah. And so although Ibrahim briefly considered this idea, Unlike Akhnaton, he discarded it, realizing that there was a bigger creator. Let's turn to Aristotle. His views about science ruled the world for thousands of years. In about 380 BC, he proclaimed that the objects of the sky, like the sun, the moon, and the stars, were made of a perfect, unchanging substance called ether. And ether is derived from a Greek word meaning to shine or to glow. And that the ether was like nothing on earth. And so, really the sun then needed no further explanation because it was made of this magical substance known as the ether, which was perfect and permanent and glowed in and of its own essence. And so that was Aristotle's view about the sun, and the moon, and the stars, all of the heavenly objects. This view, Aristotelian science, ruled the world until the beginning of the intellectual renaissance, until the famous names, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton. And it was in about 1609 that Galileo changed the world by inventing the telescope. And when he looked with his telescope at the sun, lo and behold, he saw sunspots. So the sun then was not a perfect ethereal ball of light. It was actually marred by these sunspots. And by observing the sunspots, Galileo realized that the sun rotates on its axis about once every 27 days. So for those who are listening, ask yourselves, did you know that? Did you know that the sun rotates on its own axis just like the earth? And so it began to seem that the sun was not this otherworldly thing, but that perhaps it was some sort of matter. What kind of matter? Entirely unclear. Galileo's discovery was preceded by a change of viewpoint to the heliocentric worldview. It was about this time that people began to question Aristotle and Ptolemy and their geocentric point of view, where they thought everything rotated about the earth. In 1543, just before his death, and he did this on purpose because he did not want repercussions, Copernicus publishes his famous work on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, where he postulates that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. 
Some years later, Galileo agrees with him, and he is prosecuted by the Inquisition and forced to recant these heresies. In 1672, the scientist Giovanni Cassini calculates the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This was another milestone for humanity, and it turned out that the Sun was much further than anyone had imagined. It was about 93 million miles away. So, to appear as it does, being that far away, people calculated that it must be huge. In fact, about 865,000 miles in diameter, the Earth is only about 8,000, and so it is less than 1% of the Sun's diameter. And so this is where humanity had gotten in the late 1600s. And so it became more and more essential to understand what is this sun? What is it made of? What is it that makes it shine? So hopefully I've left you here on a cliffhanger and you will join us for the next episode as we walk through this amazing intellectual journey. And remember, it is this intellect which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted us with that makes us special. So when we use it and when we realize what humans have done with it, we are, inshallah, in fact, glorifying our Creator and showing our gratitude. Assalamu alaikum and see you in the next episode. Inshallah.